Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Keep your Bibles open to Hebrews. As Diana just read, in Hebrews chapter 10, For yet a little while he who is coming will come. Who is that that will come? Jesus, right? What event is that? The second coming. For a little while, he who is coming will come, and he will not tarry. Now the just shall what? But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Let's look at verses 1 through 3. It should be right here on the same page. The writer of Hebrews now goes into faith, and he gives us a definition of it. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen, so the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. And then it goes in to list all of these heroes of faith. This morning, the title of the sermon is The Source of Our Faith. And I want to share with you this morning some insights of a saving faith in Christ. We had a beautiful Sabbath school class this morning. Um, and if you missed it, I just want to extend an invitation to come to the Sabbath School class. The Sabbath School class, in my opinion, is the most important part of the church service because this part that we're doing here, I speak, you sit. The Sabbath School class, you get to have a good amount of time to dig deeply into the Word of God. And this church has been blessed with teachers who have spent a lifetime studying the Word of God so that they can share that with others. And this morning's class was fantastic. We talked about deception. We also talked about faith. How many of you guys are familiar with Jack Sequeira? Jack Sequeira uh, spent a lot of time overseas. One of the places he went to was Ethiopia. And while he was there in Ethiopia, he was talking with some of the young people there. And in talking with them, there was a point in history where Ethiopia was overtaken by communists. So what do you do as a Christian when your government and your nation is overtaken by communists? Is there going to be a conflict there? So the rules that the communist government put down were very clear, and that was that there was no religion. As a Christian, you could not pray, you could not go to church, and you could not read your Bible, and if they caught you doing any of those three things, you were put to death. It's pretty clear, right? So what Square found, and found troubling, was that the Christians that he was talking to, the Adventists, there were a lot of them that were shaky in their faith. And what he found is that the Pentecostals that were there, they were steadfast in their faith. And they were ready and willing to die for their faith in Jesus Christ. Do you know what he found out made the difference? He said that the Pentecostals had an assurance of their salvation. They may have been wrong on a lot of other things, the Sabbath, the state of the day, and all that. But they had an assurance of their salvation that allowed them to be ready to die for their faith. Brothers and sisters, that's the kind of faith we should have. There is assurance in Jesus Christ. And as long as I've been an Adventist, that's always been a shaky thing with a lot of people that I talk to. Did Christ die for the sins of the world? Yes. Does that mean your sins as well? Yes. 
So let's look at some scriptures this morning. And we're going to go through quite a few. Um, let's go back to Hebrews chapter 11 and look at verses 1 through 3. Paul sets out what faith is. Faith is the substance of things what? Hope for. The evidence of things what? Now listen, if you see it, when it comes to faith, you are asked to believe in an invisible God. Is that right? An invisible God that you can't necessarily touch or feel. But yet this God is the God that created the heavens and the earth. And I love the fact that he words this to where faith starts with actually believing that God is, and two, that God made everything. Because in our day and age today, there is so much confusion of origins, not just in public schools, but I'm talking within Adventism and within Adventist colleges. Now, what is our name? Seventh Day Adventist. What's the seventh day part of the name mean? We celebrate creation and we do that by worshiping on what? The Sabbath. There should never be any evolutionary teaching or thought within the Adventist church. Why? Because we're Seventh Day Adventists. But I have read and I have seen and I have talked to those who try to because they do not believe the scripture. They try to bring evolutionary thinking and creation together. Do you know what you get when you do that? Confusion and nothing. All right? Nothing. Because you neuter the scripture and I don't know what that does to evolution. I don't really care. Because I've never been able to grasp how you can believe that in the first place. But, God created the heavens and the earth, and He has told us that that is why we should worship Him. Because He is the Creator, we are the creatures. But in our futility, we now worship the creature instead of the Creator. So, God throughout the history of this world, from the fall of Adam to our day today, has made ample preparation, has made ample, there's a word I can't remember what it is, He has done everything He possibly can to make sure that His people are not deceived. That's what we went over in our Sabbath school class today, is it right? God has given us His Word. He has shown us through His power in nature, His majesty and His power. He has shown us through the life, the death, the resurrection of the Son, Jesus Christ, that we can have faith in Him. The Bible tells us that if we want to please God, we got to have what? Faith. Now, how many are here this morning that keep wondering about whether they're saved or whether they're lost. Do you realize that that question was taken care of 2,000 some years ago? It's not a question anymore. The question isn't, isn't has God saved me? Because John 3.16 says what? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever, and here's the key word, believes in Him, should have what? Okay. So we looked at Roman, I mean Hebrews 11, 1 through 3, and I'll finish that. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. God is not dependent on pre-existing matter or anything else to create. That's always the problem with evolution. You go back to the Big Bang, 
Well, where did all that stuff come from? No answer, right? So hence, now you hear science talk about intelligent design. One of the things you need to realize is Satan never sleeps. And Satan never gives up. And Satan is extremely intelligent. And he uses that intelligence to deceive us. And if you do not have a strong faith, if you do not understand or even read God's word, how are you going to be able to stand against all the deceptions that keep coming? Over and over, and it never ends. Once you take care of one issue, one problem, there's five more right behind it. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. And go backwards. Romans chapter 8. Let's look at verses 22 through 25. Romans chapter 8, 22. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Verse 23. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting the adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For we were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? Do you understand what Paul is saying there? We are called to have faith and believe in Jesus Christ. We are called to let that hurt hope burn inside us that the darkness of this world should not be able to extinguish. But do we see that hope? If we see it, why do we keep hoping for it? Okay, It's something that's going to be in the future. And I want you to think about what I just said, and then I want you to think about the experience of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the three fathers of Israel, the three fathers of the faith. Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Abraham, was he a rich man? Yes. Was he a very rich man? Yes. And what did he live in? Why? Couldn't he build himself a huge house to live in? Did God not call him out of his father's homeland and tell him to go into another country? Did Abraham ever see the promise fully that God promised him? Okay, so that's Abraham. Who was Abraham's son? Isaac. Isaac. Did he ever fully see the promise that God promised his father and then promised him? Jacob. Did Jacob ever see that promise fully and completely? So what allowed these three men to believe that what God said, God would do? What allowed them to be faithful all the way to the end? They had a personal relationship with their God, and they knew Him, and they trusted Him, and they were willing to die without seeing the promise fulfilled. And that, brothers and sisters, is what the world lacks today. And that is what God's church needs so badly. I want to see Jesus come. I want to be in that generation that sees Him come, come back. I don't care about the time of trouble. Do you know why? Because I can't do anything about that. What I can do is trust that God's Word is true. And that God will do what He promised to do. Amen. If God allows you to live through the time of trouble, is it you that has to make sure you do everything right, that you have all the preparations ready? No. Or do you submit and allow God to be God? Amen. So don't worry about that time of trouble. How many people do you know say, God just put me to sleep. I don't want to go through that. I want to see Christ come back. I want to be faithful to what He has called me to do. And that is to preach the Word of God, to help prepare people to meet Him in life and not in death. I am tired of the wickedness in this world. I'm tired of the pain and the sin. I want to see that end. Wow, that's kind of weak. <laughs> <laughs>
Think about it. This week, this week, they were practicing for the congressional baseball game. And what happened? What kind of world do we live in? And we're not even shocked at this stuff anymore because it happens so much. What is it that actually shocks us anymore? We become complacent and we become accepting of all the darkness and all the evil. I'm tired of that. I'm tired of that evil and that darkness and I want to see Jesus Christ. But you know what? I don't have to wait to see Him come back in the clouds of glory because Christ has called you and I to be His hands and His feet. I want to see Jesus represented in His people. I want to see Jesus represented in my life. I want others to be able to see something in me that they want. Something that is more powerful than me. Something that shows them there is love, there is goodness, and there is light still in this world. And all that lives inside of me. Because it's not I, but it's Christ who lives in me. The hope of glory. Romans 8, 23, not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for the adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? Verse 25, but if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with, what's that last word? And this, brothers and sisters, is the core of what I want to share with you today. Is that this Christian walk will require perseverance. We come to Christ. And in that process of learning all these truths in Scripture of having this new relationship with Jesus and everything is fresh and everything is exciting and we're thinking life is going to be great after this God is going to take care of everything does God take care of everything and the answer to that is yes but does God take care of everything the way you want it to be taken care of and the answer is no why because when you come to him you come to him as a babe and he's not going to keep you as a babe He's going to bring you into maturity. And that process requires growth. And if you have grown up, you realize that growth is painful, right? Yes. Perseverance is another discipline and virtue that is lacking in God's people today. If we don't get God's answer right away, if he doesn't change our circumstances right now, we lose faith and we lose hope. And we wonder where he's at. But yet God has called us to grow up in him and trust him. And to trust him, he's going to allow things to happen in your life that's going to bring you to that point. Okay, so... Turn with me back to Hebrews. Let's look at 12.2. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. When it comes to having an assurance of your salvation, what is that assurance based on? And this is where... Every Christian that's struggling with assurance, this is where their struggle lies. Their struggle lies not with Christ, but with Christian living. Because if you don't live the way you think you should live, then you displease God, how can God save you? And in the end, if you keep that thought in your head, and that's what continues to motivate and propel you, that is a religion of legalism. Because it is not you that actually produces the good works or righteousness. It is Christ in you. Amen. So, the first thing you need to realize is that your salvation is 
is and has been a done deal. There is no God save me today having to go to God tomorrow. God save me today. The next day, God save me today. God has reconciled the, will, the world unto himself through Jesus Christ. What does that actually mean? That means that there is now no enmity between you and God. Okay? And if you are in Christ, then nothing can take you out of the Father's hands. Is that assurance? Amen. So let's look at some of these texts. Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, what's his name here? And what's that last part? Okay, so, if I was to write a book and I'm the author, I'm the one that starts that book and I'm the one that finishes that book, right? So your book of life and your book of faith is started by who? Jesus Christ. And who is it ended by? Jesus Christ. So, is it you that has to work day in and day out to make sure you're in a saving relationship with Jesus Christ? God is the author and the finisher of your faith. It's a done deal. But we go back and we get confused when it comes to Christian living because we think we do that on our own. And that's another thing that God does in us. That's what the Holy Spirit is given to us for. So, now let's look at Hebrews 12.1. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by what? So great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and what? The sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with, here's another word that's the same as perseverance. What's that word? Endurance. Endurance. Why do we get so tired? Why do we run out of energy when it comes to our Christian walk? Any ideas? That wasn't a rhetorical question. <laughs> Say that again, Ricky? In the end, that's what it's all about. Is, is it all comes down to that. But what are some of the things that causes you to lose your endurance and to not have perseverance? It's hard. Say that? It's hard. Hard. Should it be hard? If Christ is the author of and the finisher of your faith, if Christ promises you the Holy Spirit, should that Christian walk be hard? Now listen, this is why faith is so important. The burning and the chastening is hard. The burning and the chastening is hard. How many of you enjoy being chastised by the Lord? Raise your hand. It's unanimous. But how many of you are glad that God loves you so much that He will chastise you? Raise your hand. Again, unanimous. The reason why it's hard, and we looked at this in the Sabbath school class, is because we have been born with a sinful nature. Our natural bent, as Chuck showed this morning, is I wake up and I'm bent towards sin and doing what's wrong. You do not have to teach a child or a baby to do things that are wrong. They know that automatically, right? <laughs> you have to teach them to do right, correct? And, and that doesn't end after childhood is over with. Adults continuously have to be taught to do the right things. That's our condition outside of Christ, and that's why Without the indwelling of God, we are a hopeless race. This is one of the things that I love about humanists who believe that if given enough time, the human race will evolve into a much better, I don't know, a much better yeah, yeah, a much better race. There's the word. Now, how long have we been here? From the fall of Adam, how long have we been here? Have we gotten any better? When you read the stories in Genesis chapter 3, 4, 5, let's just take Cain and Abel. Have we gotten any better than Cain? 
you keep looking at the way the world is going, and, and I just see a lot of darkness, right? But this is why I love Jesus Christ, and this is why I love His people. It's because it's in His people that I see hope. It's in His people that I see love. It's in His people that I see Christ in the flesh. And that in turn strengthens me and helps me to endure the hardships of this life. Christian walk, brothers and sisters, as you know, is not an easy thing. But, it's also not an impossible thing. Because if Christ is for you, what's the rest of that scripture? Who can be against you? Okay? So let's continue on. I have my page turned. We were in Hebrews chapter 12. We read verses 1 and 2. Turn with me to Jude. It's going to be right before the book of Revelation. Jude is like one page, so sometimes it's very hard to find. Jude, and we're going to look at verse 24. If you mark your Bibles, mark this verse. If you like to memorize scripture, memorize this verse. Memorize that Christ is the author and the finisher of your faith. And also memorize this. Verse 24. Now to him who is able to what? Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you. I love this word. What's Christ able to do? He's able to present you faultless. Where? Before Throne, right? Isn't that good news? That is the gospel. That is what Christ has done for you, in you, and with you. Brothers and sisters, you have an assurance of salvation that is the foundation of everything you build on in this life so that you can go through good times, bad times, extremely hard times, and never be shaken in your foundation. Why? Because God loves you. And nothing changes that love that He has for you. <clears throat> Let me share this with you as well. We are saved through faith and by faith. We're not saved because of our faith. Do you understand that? We're saved by who we have our faith in. It is Christ that saves us. And it is that faith in Christ that saves and works in us. Amen? Amen. Okay. It is not your faith that saves you. It is the object of that faith. And that object is Jesus Christ. Your faith simply links you with Jesus. Now, this is the key to living victoriously in Christ. And that is that you actually believe that what God's Word says. Gee, didn't we hear this in our Sabbath school class? Okay, I'm not going to say it the same way. But at some point, you have to take what you read in God's Word. <coughs> And not just have it up here, but you internalize it to where now it's down in you and it becomes a part of you. To that it allows you to look at your world and you filter every experience you have through that word of faith. That whatever happens, good or bad, that Christ is there, Christ is living in me, my salvation is assured and nothing, nothing can take me out of his hands. Except one thing. Yeah. Do you know what that one thing is? Yeah. And that is unbelief. Do you know what the unpardonable sin is? Grieving the Holy Spirit. Grieving the Holy Spirit. But it can be. It can be. Uh, it can be summed up in one word. That word is unbelief. The unpardonable sin. 
The unpardonable sin is not breaking God's Ten Commandments, because all those things can be forgiven, right? The unpardonable sin is turning your back on grace. Because if you turn your